means power. Carry on, yes. Please. So, um, Mark chapter 6. I'm going to talk about a volunteer moment that the disciples had with Jesus. And uh, some of the things that can cause us to shrink back from service that God's after our hearts in. In Mark chapter 6. At the end of verse 29, John the Baptist is just being beheaded. And actually the Gospel of Matthew tells us that when Jesus heard that news, he withdrew by boat to a solitary place with his disciples. And so that's actually where we picked up pick up the report here in Mark 6. So Jesus is in mourning. He's just lost his cousin, John the Baptist. You know, partner in the ministry. He's in grief. He wants to get away. And the apostles in verse Mark chapter 6, verse 30, the apostles gathered around Jesus, reported to him all they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So in the middle of John the Baptist being beheaded and the grief of all that, there's still ministry going on and off. And they were so busy, they hadn't had a chance to eat yet. And so Jesus says, come on, let's get away and rest. And so they go to a solitary place, but then verse 33, all the people see them, they recognize them, they on the, they start following on the crowd. 34, Jesus landed and saw a large crowd. He had compassion on them. And so then he preaches to them. And then... This is the beginning of the feeding of the 5,000. Remember, the disciples hadn't had a chance to eat yet. They were so busy, they hadn't had a chance to eat, and they were in grief, and they just wanted time with Jesus. But Jesus thrust them back into ministry mode right then, yeah. in the middle of grief, in the middle of lack, in the middle of hunger. Wow. All right? And then all these people, and then Jesus turns to the disciples, because uh, the disciples are saying, this is remote, it's very late. Verse 36, send the people away so they can go to the surrounding countryside villages and buy themselves something to eat. Really, they're saying, Jesus, send them away so we can get something to eat. <laughs> but Jesus answered them, you give them something to eat. Yeah. You give. And you can hear the offense that comes back as a res reply from the disciples. They said to him, that would take more than a half a year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? Mm. They hadn't had a chance to eat yet. And Jesus says, now you give them something to eat. Jesus says, how many loaves do you have? Of course, five and two fish. Jesus breaks them, breaks the loaves, does the miracle. Okay, But there's an offense that is starting in the hearts of the disciples. And you can see it. And actually it continues and we hear about it. Look. Verse 42, right after Jesus dismisses the crowd, the disciples go on the boat, and there's a wind against them, and Jesus comes walking on the water, right? Peter gets out, but they get back in. Verse 49, when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they were all saw him and were terrified. Immediately he spoke to them and said, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Then he climbed in the boat with them. The wind died down. They were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves. For their hearts were hardened. <laughs> See, their hearts were hardened because they didn't get the miracle that just happened because they were offended because Jesus asked them to serve out of their lack. To serve out of their place of need that they needed some space. And Jesus put them right back into ministry mode. And in fact, uh, John gets, the Gospel of John records it really personally. Uh, Jesus turns to Philip. This is a discipleship moment for Philip. Verse, John 6, verse 5, Jesus looked and saw the great crowd coming, and he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? Verse 6, he asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. <laughs> so Jesus was setting Philip up. Philip answered, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have just a bite. <laughs> right? So I want to talk about when God asks us to serve. Yeah. Mm. And the things that can keep us from volunteering freely are these moments in the ministry when we're giving, we're giving, we're giving. Tragedy strikes. We're in lack. We're in want. And Jesus says, you be the supply. Mm. You be the answer. And it can offend our minds. Say, God, how can you ask this of me? How can you expect me to do this? I've given. 
God actually challenged me on something a couple of weeks ago uh, about my terminology of how I phrase things, about, about how I phrase and how I view my service to the Lord. Um, because I, I had said, I said to him, God, it's not working out the way I thought it would. <laughs> In the ministry, you regularly have conversations, my wife and I, saying, well, do we keep at it or are we just, are we missing something? You know, because you're looking for the results, right? And sometimes the results don't come and you feel like just hanging up the boot. And uh, so I had a conversation with the Lord. I said, God, I don't get it. I don't get it. I said, I, I, uh, I thought it would be different. I thought that you would honor my sacrifice. <laughs> and God stopped me in my tracks and said, what have you given me? I said, God, I've given you my time. I give you my finances. I give you my days. I give you my nights. And God said, then why did you do it? <laughs> what sacrifice is it to you? First Chronicles 29, David's talking to God, and he says, Wealth and honor come from you, the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, O oh God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you, and we have only given you what comes from your hands. Come on. Right. That's, the scripture again? That's uh, First Chronicles 29, verse 14. David says, We've only given you, everything we've given you is only that which has come from your hand. So God challenged me and said, what you give me, what you give me as a, what, a so-called sacrifice, it all comes from me anyway. And so I realized God's not after my time. He's not after my money. He's not after my work. He's after my heart. He wants me to volunteer freely in the day of his battle, in the day of his power. And so he offends me sometimes so that he reveals the wrong perspective that's in my heart regarding my service unto the Lord. And so he's making me change my terminology. Even the verses of, uh, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, right? holy and pleasing to God. This is your reasonable act of service of worship. right? Offer your bodies. What do you have left if your body's taken out of the way? Not a lot in this life, right? You have your spirit that's left behind. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice unto the Lord. This is in view of God's mercy, in view of everything he's done for you. Uh, offer your bodies. Offer your everything. Empty it all out. And God spoke to Liz and I when we were early days in our ministry, when we were just married. And he used this word. He said, empty yourselves on people. Mm -hmm. pour yourself out on people and we've tried as best as we can to do that but every once in a while like two weeks ago the Lord gives me a course correction right because I thought I had given it all to the Lord and all of a sudden he's gently but properly rebukes me for my perspective on why am I doing this why am I doing it am I doing it and the people who sowed into PTL for all those years why did they do it did they do it to to build a ministry did they do it because they expected something in return? Because when I give to God, I actually, whether I like to admit it or not, I expect a return on it. Mm -hmm. I expect God to honor my sacrifice, right? And so, and he does, and he will, but usually not in the way I expect him to. And so, if as you're serving in this ministry, and I, as I've said, we, we boast about this team that we have, but as you're serving in this ministry, please don't do it because... You just want to honor Peter and Joy or Jesse and Liz. If you do it because we ask you to, of course there's things that as a family we just take care of and no one else is doing it, so sure, I'll, I'll throw it in. That's part of our offering freely everything that we are, everything that we have. But, but as it pertains to the areas that you lead in ministry, if you do it because you just want to bless, be a blessing to us, let me tell you, the pay is not good enough for that. <laughs> You're going to rip yourself off. Because you might, get, you might get a thank you from us. You might get a pat on the back. Uh, you, you may not because we're so busy and either forget you or we don't even realize all the things that you're doing That's true. in the ministry. And so if you're doing it for the thank you, if you're doing it for um, just to honor man, it is not enough. It, it is God wants 
all of it. He so wants good. all our hearts, yes, all he our does. lives. He wants us to pour it out as an offering unto Him. Good. And so I just feel there needs to be this course correction, this course change for us as, a, as the people of God. Um, you know, and we've had some people join us recently like Art and like Ray and Lisa. And they serve and they serve and they serve. And when they're done that, they say, how can I serve more? Mm -hmm. It's excessive. I, I haven't seen it to this level in maybe ever. Uh, but they find such joy in it. It's, they find such joy in it. Because, you know, when we get to see the Lord face to face, of course, we read that verse that says, you know, if you're faithful with little God, I'll give you more, and then he'll say, well done, good and faithful servant. Right? Uh, nothing brings more joy than honoring our master in this way. But you don't have to wait until you get to heaven to hear those words. If you're serving the Lord with a pure heart, if you're serving him and knowing that you're in the will of God, you will hear that voice in your heart today. You'll hear that voice, well done. And it's the adulation from heaven, of course, that makes all the difference, right? Uh, I live, you know, we live our whole lives for him. And uh, Derek Prince, you've probably heard Pastor Peter say this. Derek Prince said, there's always two things. There's two things that are never convenient. One is judgment day, and the other is the call of God on your life. Mm. And the call of God on your life is costly. It will cost you something. And so... Uh, Revelation 10 talks about the little scroll. <laughs> you remember that, that John saw this angel that had a little scroll in his hand. Of course, there's the scroll that the lamb had in his hand. It had to do with the eternal purposes of God for the planet. But there was an angel that had a little scroll. And the word of the Lord came to John saying, Take the little scroll and eat it. This is, this is his scroll. This is his mandate from heaven. right? And he ate it. And he was warned beforehand, It will taste sweet, but in your stomach it will turn sour. And so he took the scroll, and he said it was as sweet as honey in his mouth, but as soon as it was in his stomach, it turned sour. This is like the call of God in your life. This is what it means to work out your salvation, your destiny, your calling in the Lord. There's a sweetness in it, but there's a, there's a this is costly to me. This, this costs me my comfort. This costs me my, sometimes my feelings of health. My, you know, I pour out, I pour out, I pour out. So, um, I'm just trying to abbreviate this because we were, we were short on time. But um, in a, So, in our service to the Lord, uh, I want to I thank you. I want to encourage you. Don't give up, as Pastor Peter said this morning. Keep your hand taped to that plow. Keep your hand taped to the plow because uh, too many people have stepped away from the plow because of disappointments in the kingdom of man that was supposed to be the kingdom of God. Uh, but our hearts are that at Antioch and, and as the Lord does this move in the church that, that the people find that when they give and when they do it unto the Lord that uh, there is kingdom fruit that comes from it. And who knew 30 years ago when everything went down in PTL that we would be there for restoration purposes for this time so that everything that was sown would be honored. See, God brings the investment back may not come in the timing we expect, may not come in the way we expect, but it is not wasted. Every service to the Lord, it is not wasted Amen. in God. Right. And we are, we are um, harvesting where other people have sown now on the property that we're on. And so we, we praise God, we bless God for everything that was sown into that building. Everything that was sown into that ministry that you think, well, what, what good was it? What point came from it? God will turn it. God will use it. The prophecies of it for that property or that Amen. glory of the Lord. Amen. Glory of the latter house will be greater than the former. Amen. And we believe that Amen. in that place. Amen. And you guys are part of this. You're a big part of it. In fact, if if our team doesn't get it, we won't be able to go there. That's true. Because the job of the fivefold is to equip the saints, body of Christ, to do the work of the ministry. The job of the fivefold actually isn't to do the work of the ministry. It's to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. And so if we don't have a team that are volunteering freely saying, yes, this is my place on the wall, then the work of the ministry just doesn't get done to the extent that it's supposed to. And then there's gaps and breaches in the wall. And so thank you for taking your post on the wall. And I want to encourage you, don't let the disappointments 
that you face, the offenses that can come when people don't recognize what God's put in you, or the offense that comes when God asks you to give more than what, what you've already given. And maybe us as leaders have asked you to give more than you've already given. You think, I've, I've already laid my life down for 40 years and it didn't work, so thanks, but pass. Our job at Antioch, when we started the church, I asked God, I prayed, I said, Lord, why? Why are you asking us to start a church in the church district? Because there's so many churches on that property already. Yeah. And we weren't even in the building that we're in now. We were at Narrow Way. We were just starting a church in Fort Mill. And God said to me, it is time for so many ministers who aren't fulfilling the call of God on their lives to get back onto the purposes of God. And God wanted to bring restoration. And God, So God spoke to me that Antioch was to be a place of restoration for ministers. And then God gives us this building, which to us is just a picture of the purposes of God, of your lives. Who some of some of you have served the Lord faithfully for so many years, and you're looking for the answer, looking for the fire, looking for the glory. And I'm here to tell you that the Lord's day of battle is approaching. The day of His power is approaching. It's His battle. And as we enter into this next year, He's looking for a people who will volunteer freely, free of the disappointments of the past, free of the Lord, I don't have enough. Because mm -hmm. the, the real answer is, when I give my all to God, He gives His all to Oh, that's so true. <clears throat> when I belong to Him, mm -hmm. He belongs to me. Mm -hmm. This is what He showed me a couple weeks back when I said, God, I've given you all these things. And He goes, yes, but do you belong to me? Do you belong to me, said the Lord. I belong to you. He said, then I belong to you. What's better than belonging to the King of Kings? Actually, him belonging to us is yes. even a greater mystery, even a greater miracle that the King of Heaven belongs to us. His glory, his strength, his miracle-working power, the future, the battle that's his, it belongs to us when we belong to him, when we give him our all in the midst of our disappointments, in the midst of offense even at how people could ask us. And so I've always struggled with asking people to do something that I felt I could do. Uh, I'm a doer. And so I'm, I've learned in my, my new role as senior pastor, I'm like, I can, actually can't do it all. Wow. I have to have <laughs> yeah, the, the yeah, people yeah. of God do it. Yeah. <laughs> so but I've had to learn. It's been difficult for me to ask people to do things. And maybe this is your predisposition with the people who work in your ministry. But but when you get it, and Pastor Peter never has a problem asking people, how does he do that? How can he unashamedly ask people to do something, to sacrifice even more? I thought, that can be offensive. But it's because he understands who he serves, who he works for, who owns him, and who owns the body of Christ. And he understands what the call of God is on people's lives. And so it's not offensive when we ask people, to give their all mm -hmm. to the one who owns it all. Mm -hmm. And so I want to encourage you as leaders, mm -hmm. don't be afraid to call people up mm -hmm. and, and encourage them. Mm -hmm. You know what? Give it all to God because mm -hmm. when you belong to him, then he belongs to you. Yeah. Yeah. Close good. Good. Thank you, Jesse. I want to add a little something to this. Think of working with people like putting money in the bank. Every time you ask somebody to do something, you make a withdrawal. You take some money out of the bank. You cannot keep withdrawing without putting more in the bank. That's right. Or else you have an empty bank account. That's right. You go bankrupt. And people... It's the same way you treat children, or your wife, or your husband or any relationship that you have. If you're going to make withdrawals, you better keep putting something in. Mm -hmm. yes. This has to do with your care and your love. Your focus and your life. And what you give to people. So, First of all, you are all called to serve beyond what you're able to do. And you mustn't get offended 
That's the lesson <laughs> that Jesse has taught us today. But then if you're leaders, the only reason you're leaders is because somebody's following. If nobody's following, you're not a leader. Even if they call you one. Then you have this responsibility to call those that you're leading to sacrifice. And it goes against your good behavior and your politeness. But if you don't call people to sacrifice, you rob them of the glory of God. And they may say no, but ask them anyway. Right. Because some will say yes. Mm -hmm. But you must always give something before you take something. You have to put something in the bank. So I trust that all of you who have been to this leaders retreat so far realize that you received something. Last night in our teaching, the fellowship, the camaraderie, the presence of the Lord, the moment you received something. And you said in your heart, thank you, Lord, for letting me be here. And thank you for letting me be part. Out of that, something is required to serve. So, what do you think about giving and giving and giving to others and then calling them to sacrifice mm -hmm. so that they can do the same? Mm -hmm. I would like three of you to pray um, in response to Pastor mm -hmm. Jesse's word to us today. It's very powerful what he shared. Mm -hmm. Do not lay back when it comes to the opportunity to minister. You should be clamoring over each other to be the one to pray. Your leaders. Mm -hmm. I expect you to lead. So that means step out. Step in faith. If your heart is beating fast, you need to respond to this word. That's the first indicator. You got a race horse inside your chest. <laughs> That's how you know. It's an indicator. So I want three of you to pray. And to pray in response to this word of service as the Lord leads you. Go for it. <laughs> 